Since the beginning of this year, the disturbance of Taiwan by CCP military aircraft has become a regular occurrence. On April 4th, the PLA's Liaoning aircraft carrier fleet entered the U.S.-controlled First Island chain and blocked Taiwan for military exercises, simulating how the CCP might interrupt U.S. military support when they attack the island in the future. These escalating provocations are not only a way for the CCP to test the Biden administration's response, but also a step-by-step -step rehearsal for its invasion of Taiwan. Recently, the U.S. Navy released a photo on its official website that was taken on April 4th. In the photo, the Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyer USS Mustin DDG-89 is seen side-by-side -side with the Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning in the Philippine Sea off the eastern coast of Taiwan. The two ships were only a few thousand feet apart, with the Liaoning's number 16 and the aircrafts on its deck clearly visible. The ship's captain, Commander Robert J. Briggs, was pictured leaning back in his seat with his legs up as he monitored the aircraft carrier with his deputy commander, Lieutenant Commander Richard D. Sly. The two didn't even need binoculars. Satellite photos posted by several groups monitoring the warship on social networks show that the Mustin was still in the vicinity of the Liaoning aircraft carrier on April 10th. This indicates that the Liaoning aircraft carrier fleet was tracked and monitored by the U.S. destroyer for several days, and was so close that it was even within the naval artillery's firing range. Judging by this photo of relaxed monitoring of the PLA deliberately released by the U.S. Navy, it seems that they do not take the combat capability of the Liaoning aircraft carrier seriously at all. Taiwanese military expert Lü Li Shi posted an article on social media. He said that the U.S. military's actions indicate that the U.S. had detected the movement of the Liaoning fleet a long time ago and dispatched the USS Mustin to monitor the fleet all the way through the Miyako waterway from the East China Sea and eastward into the Philippine Sea. In addition to monitoring, the U.S. military also gave a significant response to the CCP's provocations on April 4th. The USS Roosevelt Aircraft Carrier Battle Group suddenly moved into the South China Sea and then drilled with the Malaysian Air Force. This was followed by the USS Macon Island amphibious warship sailing into the South China Sea and drilling jointly with the USS Roosevelt on April 9th. Additionally, on April 7th, another U.S. Navy destroyer crossed the Taiwan Strait. For now, the Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning has entered the South China Sea, while two PLA ships are sailing towards the Taiwan Strait. The U.S.-China tug-of-war in the South China Sea is escalating, and the possibility of a U.S.-China military confrontation is growing exponentially. For the past few decades, the Middle East has been the focus of U.S. overseas strategy. But while the U.S. has been embroiled in the war on terrorism in the Middle East for the past 20 years, this time has become two golden decades for the development of the Chinese Communist Party. The regime has become one of the biggest opponents of the U.S. without any warning. The United States finally realized that the CCP is its greatest threat when the Trump administration took office and began to reverse its strategic direction to deal with it. Accordingly, the U.S. has begun to adjust its global military allocation and is shifting its focus from the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific, advancing the Indo-Pacific strategy and strengthening alliances to form a combined effort against the Chinese Communist Party. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that the United States has withdrawn at least three Patriot anti-missile batteries from the Gulf region, including one from Prince Sultan Air Base in Saudi Arabia. Some military resources, including an aircraft carrier and surveillance systems, are also being transferred from the Middle East to respond to military needs in other parts of the world. Other adjustments are also being considered. The report said, Some equipment, including reconnaissance drones and anti-missile batteries, may be redeployed to focus on leading global competitors, including the Chinese Communist Party and Russia. Last June, the Los Angeles Times reported that the Pentagon was increasingly concerned that the CCP's expanding missile arsenal and military capabilities would threaten the security of the U.S.'s military bases and allies in Asia. The U.S. is preparing to deploy hundreds of conventional missiles in Asia. The article stated, 
The missile plan is the centerpiece of a planned buildup of U.S. military power in Asia, projected to consume tens of billions of dollars in the defense budget over the next decade, a major shift in Pentagon spending priorities away from the Middle East. On the 2nd of last August, the U.S. formally withdrew from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, making it possible for the U.S. military to deploy missiles in the Western Pacific. The article said that in 2019, the Pentagon was testing several new short-range missiles with a range of up to 3,400 miles, including a ballistic missile that could be placed on U.S. territory in Guam and a mobile missile carried on a truck. These weapons are expected to be operational within two years, although no announcement has been made as to where they will be deployed. Currently, U.S. warships and aircraft in Asia also carry similar missiles, but don't carry any land-based missile system. On March 9th, Philip Davidson, commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, testified in the Senate Armed Services Committee that the most pressing U.S. defense need is to deploy long-range missiles in Asia that can threaten the Chinese Communist Party, and that there is a need to replenish offensive missiles with large ranges. On March 31st. Indo-Pacific Alliance member Australia also announced that it would spend one billion Australian dollars to work closely with the United States to develop its own advanced guided missiles, with a focus on medium and long-range missiles in line with the U.S. missile program. In addition, the United States will rebuild the first fleet in the Western Pacific to ensure a stronger deterrent. The U.S. Navy's seventh fleet. Currently headquartered in Yokosuka, Japan, is the only fleet based in the Asia-Pacific region, covering the waters of the Indo-Pacific. But with the Chinese Communist Party's expanding military capabilities in the South China Sea, the Seventh Fleet's deterrent capability has diminished. According to the USNI, in October last year, Secretary of the Navy Kenneth Braithwaite said in the Naval Submarine League that the Navy will create a new fleet to be deployed at the crossroads between the Indian and Pacific Oceans, possibly in Singapore, or it could be a maneuverable ocean patrol. But most importantly, it could provide a greater deterrent. Last November, Braithwaite made it official at a Senate hearing that the U.S. Navy's first fleet would be rebuilt and deployed to the Indo-Pacific region. Also, in order to improve our posture in the Indo-Pacific, we will reconstitute the first fleet, assigning it primary responsibility for the Indo and South Asian region as an expeditionary fleet, back to the capabilities and unpredictability of an agile, mobile at sea command. Secretary of Naval Operations Michael Gildy also said on April 5th that the U.S. Navy is closely examining the deployment of forces in the Indo-Pacific region and is considering the creation of a new first fleet to control the Indian and Pacific Oceans in order to reduce the burden on the Seventh Fleet. The U.S. Navy's combat capability in the Western Pacific will also be greatly enhanced. Last year on December 11th. U.S. Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021, which includes the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. This initiative is perhaps the most significant piece of legislation on Asia in recent years, signaling the beginning of a shift in U.S. strategic focus. According to Indo-Pacific Command Commander Davidson in a congressional hearing, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative includes. Establishing a precision strike combat network that can withstand enemy attacks on the first island chain in the Western Pacific, deploying ground-based Aegis missile defense system in Guam, deploying tactical multifunctional radar in Palau, a Pacific island nation, and setting up multiple combat field training bases throughout the area so that the U.S. and allied forces can train and fight together. On March 7th, a former U.S. Navy admiral revealed in Nikkei News that the U.S. is planning for operations in the South China Sea. One of the plans is to fight a guerrilla war with the CCP at sea and first strike at the CCP's militarized artificial islands in the South China Sea. The Marine Corps would penetrate deep into the South China Sea using armed drones, offensive networks, missiles, and even anti-ship strike weapons to combat the CCP's maritime forces, as well as the land-based combat bases. In addition, the U.S. Navy will become more active in patrolling China's coastal waters and gradually include allies in its free patrol force to counter the CCP's claim of sovereignty in the South China Sea. 
The U.S. also hopes to convince Australia, New Zealand, India, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and Vietnam to participate in patrolling the South China Sea, creating a global maritime alliance to counter the CCP fleet. The U.S. military will also deploy forces close to mainland China, including enhancing the capabilities of U.S. forces stationed in Korea and Japan. And the Army and Air Force will also conduct additional training and exercises with Taiwan. The newly formed U.S. Space Force is also expected to concentrate intelligence and reconnaissance in the area. These actions indicate that the U.S. military is fully prepared for a military confrontation against the Chinese Communist Party. From strategic adjustments to specific short- and medium-term military deployments to a very targeted South China Sea strategy, the U.S. is confident of victory. As chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Republican Senator Jim Inhofe and Democratic Senator Jack Reed said in an article they wrote last year that there is only one conclusion for Beijing: not today. You militarily cannot win it, so don't even try it.